Thank you very much. We will start with the questions, if I may, uh, right away. Um, you have experienced a lot. Uh, you are one of the most uh, famous uh, scholars in the world, and you have witnessed many, many uh, serious events, being the war in Vietnam, the collapse of the Soviet Union, invasion of the United States and its allies in Iraq, Afghanistan. However, uh, today often we hear uh, that the situation at the moment is actually the most uh, serious as it was, the most threatening as it was after the Second World War. Do you share this opinion? We certainly have uh, really grave dangers. We also have uh, good solutions to these if we keep our head on and if we're honest about the situation. Of course, there have been moments uh, of absolutely immediate peril. I think back 61 years, and I remember it actually, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, when we were just uh, within uh, a, a moment of uh, nuclear war, uh, and it was only extraordinarily wise leadership by President Kennedy and by Nikita Khrushchev that pulled the two countries back from the brink of complete disaster for the world. We're not standing at the edge exactly that way, but boy, are we uh, creating risks like the war in Ukraine, which is really a war between the United States and Russia, uh, though it's being fought in Ukraine by Ukrainians, it's a proxy war. And now uh, this war in Gaza, uh, which is a, a war fought by Israel, but made possible by the United States and is extremely dangerous. And the high tensions between the United States and China, which again, I blame the United States for uh, as the main reason. Add those up. It's a bad situation. But then add on top of that the fact that we have the man-made dangers of environmental destruction, uh, climate change, pollution, destruction of our fisheries and our forests that is very serious, very far along, and even denied by many political leaders. We still have political leaders who are scientifically ignorant, who aggressively deny uh, what is uh, absolutely uh, facing us, which is a uh, terrible uh, destabilization of the physical systems for our food supplies, our forests, uh, our fisheries, and so forth. So you add this all up, it's a terribly uh, difficult and bad time and maybe what makes everyone so nervous on top of it is that the quality of political leadership is extremely low. Uh, our president is 81 years old and should be in retirement. This is absolutely obvious. Uh, our Congress is quite corrupt in the United States because we have a, a system of campaign financing that depends on billions and billions of dollars going from big companies to the uh, congressmen and senators. Uh, and the U.S. isn't alone in this. Uh, there's a, a great deal of instability, and our political leaders don't know how to get along with each other. Uh, so you add this all up, it's definitely bad, whether it's absolutely the worst. It's a little hard to judge, but it's bad enough that we ought to do something about it. Uh, you actually mentioned many questions that I was going to ask, uh, but um, if I understand correctly, um, how did we get there actually? So definitely there is some kind of crisis of leadership, because I believe that the problem is not only a senior American president, uh, uh, well, and uh, well, these, these problems can be also in, in other countries. Uh, then of course, there's a concentration of unprecedented crises, uh, and of course, there is a part, I would say, that's considering the decisions that the superpowers make 
would, would you agree with this, with this combination? I think if I could uh, put one word on uh, the reason we're in this crisis, it is arrogance. Arrogance of the rich and the powerful. And um, the United States uh, was the richest and the most powerful uh, of all during this period. So the arrogance of the United States uh, has been extremely notable. You know, when the Cold War ended in uh, 1989 uh, in uh, uh, Central Europe and in 1991 in uh, the former Soviet Union, we might have said, now we have a glorious opportunity for peace, for cooperation, and for prosperity. Uh, this didn't happen. It could have happened. I was there. I saw what could have been done. Uh, instead, the United States said, we won. We're the best. We're the most powerful. We don't have to deal with anybody except on our own terms. And the United States absolutely uh, went from arrogant to hyper arrogant uh, and said, we can do what we want, where we want. And strangely enough, though, the United States basically faced no security threats after that time. It went to war more often. Than, than ever. Uh, of course, it completely uh, misjudged two things. One, it continued to think of Russia as a natural enemy. And so it, it actually created a new enemy because I was advisor to Gorbachev. I was advisor to Yeltsin. They wanted absolute peace and normal relations. There's no doubt in my mind, this wasn't a trick. It wasn't a plot. It was in an attempt to create normal relations. The United States instead said, oh, no, no, we won. We won. Now we'll move NATO. Uh, okay. Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, uh, Poland. Oh, we'll keep moving. We'll go to the Baltics. Uh, we'll go to Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, We'll go to the Balkans. Oh, no, no, no. We'll go to Ukraine. We'll go to Georgia. We'll surround Russia. We'll decolonize Russia. That's a term used in American political circles. Uh, even saying, oh, Russia should be dismembered now. Well, what on earth are these people thinking? Russia has 6,000 nuclear warheads, a powerful army, a uh, uh, self-respect, uh, and a uh, a desire for its own security. Uh, and so the United States provoked what absolutely it should not have provoked. So this was a, a part of the issue. A second part of the issue is that in general, the uh, rich became arrogant in a different way saying, oh, we're so good. We used to be millionaires, now we're billionaires. We don't have to share anything. So they became libertarian in philosophy. Libertarian uh, in American philosophy means we don't have to pay taxes because what we have is ours and nobody's going to take it away. And so we developed a super rich class uh, that became very self-righteous. That's my money. It's nobody else's money. How dare the government think to take it? And at the same time, a growing uh, amount of people struggling in poverty or losing jobs to technology, being replaced by robots, being replaced by automation. So the gap in our society between the rich and the poor widened considerably. And this was the second factor. And you would think that in a political democracy, the poor people would vote out uh, the uh, ones that uh, are uh, leaning on them or would uh, vote for tax increases on the small group of very powerful. But that theory is wrong because the small group of very powerful buy the politicians. <laughs> they, they really do. Uh, and so they pay the campaign contributions. And the first rule of the U.S. Congress is vote tax cuts for companies and, and uh, rich individuals. So that is the second thing that happened. The third thing that happened is that 
the environmental crises, especially the climate change crisis, came and would require changes in our behavior and would also cause limitations to the big energy industry, the oil, the gas, the coal industry. And um, the industry resisted those changes, said no. And the politicians said, oh, it's not even real. Uh, like uh, Václav Klaus and, and others, uh, you know, they just denied the climate change. And uh, this denial has gone on for decades, uh, actually. We just uh, saw a new uh, president of uh, Argentina elected just now who said that climate change is a socialist plot. You can't even make this up. Well, I don't know whether this is... Uh, just playing games to get elected, whether it's complete sheer ignorance, whether it's corruption, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's shocking. People in any kind of responsibility should know better. They should at least understand what this issue is about. And this has been a very big challenge. It's again, part of the arrogance. Uh, I happen to lead a scientific institute at Columbia University with hundreds of climate scientists. So I had an earful all the time about the climate science. Many people don't have that chance to hear directly. So they hear from politicians or actors or actors who want to be politicians uh, who say you know, whatever they feel like. And the result is that we go decade after decade without solving these problems, despite all the meetings, the treaties, the conferences, uh, and so forth. So when you add all of this up, uh, as I said, I think the underlying problem is arrogance of the rich and the powerful who somehow think the rules don't apply to them. Uh, and we end up in a world that is in conflict we end up in a world that is divided between rich and poor. We end up in a world that is uh, facing massive environmental crises. And it's all so weird because the world's richer than ever before, better technologies than ever before. And we could, if we chose right, move to peace immediately. I just mm -hmm. testified in the UN Security Council about four wars, the war in Ukraine, uh, the uh, war in Israel and Palestine, the war in Syria, and the war in the Sahel of Africa, which is Burkina, Mali, Chad, mm -hmm. Niger. And I pointed out all four of these huge wars could be stopped tomorrow with politics, with basic sound politics. But our leaders are just incapable of basic sound politics, unfortunately. When you mentioned arrogance and the beginning of the 90s, well, I, I am from the Czech Republic, as you know myself. So yes, we, I, I, we have a vast experience uh, <laughs> with neoliberal policies and their application. However, I, I wanted to ask about liberal democracy. Of course, we have to mention Francis Fukuyama and his end of history. And now we see how, how completely wrong that was. But uh, do you see also the, the liberal democracy as something that maybe hides more the true state of affairs uh, than actually helps to resolve uh, the conflicts? Uh, because, uh, you know, when scholars like Martin Wolf suggest that maybe instead of voting, we should have some you know, choice by chance randomly, that would be better than elect the representatives that we have. There, there's certainly something wrong. So maybe if you could elaborate on, on the liberal democracy and make, maybe it really will be an end, but the question is what kind of end it will be. It would be great if we could make democracy work uh, because uh, democracy is very attractive in principle. Uh, it's a, a way for free people to express themselves. It's a way for people to participate. 
It's a way for people to learn about social and political realities. So it, in principle, is a very attractive system. Uh, and in general, it's a way for people to have protection from their own governments because non-democratic governments can be very, very destructive of their own people because there's no control necessarily over government. So in principle, I'm a Democrat, uh, but in practice, you can see all of the difficulties of making this work. A democracy needs to have an informed public. A democracy needs to have a respectful uh, dialogue or deliberation in the public, not shouting, not even worse, uh, violence. Uh, not uh, 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 hidden influence. Uh, a democracy needs to prevent being taken over by powerful interests that use the democracy as a as a facade, uh, as a pretense rather than real democracy. So some democracies work pretty well. Uh, some in Europe work reasonably well. I would say the quality of the American democracy has declined tremendously during my lifetime. Um, maybe that's an illusion, but I feel that. And I can see even in the data that people had more confidence in government 60 years ago than they have today. And I look at that, and I've, of course, spent my whole life trying to understand that declining confidence in our government. And I find two factors uh, that are at the core of this. One is that after World War II, the United States created a security state uh, with the CIA and other institutions that were supposedly ensuring national security, but in fact, they really diminished democracy because the first principle of the CIA is that it's secret and its actions are secret. And um, it does lots of things around the world that are not good, but they're secret. So this really undermined American democracy. And um, we don't have a we don't have much public effect on foreign policy, for example, in the United States, because when it comes to foreign policy, really the president and a few uh, other people make decisions on behalf of everybody without public debate or without uh, control by any really democratic institutions other than a vote once every few years, but that's not enough because we go to war all the time against the interests of the American people. Um, so that's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem that I mentioned earlier is the big money in politics. Some countries restrict private campaign financing. In fact, most in Europe don't have a lot of corruption of the political system. But the United States, I regard as kind of legal corruption, legal in the sense that our Supreme Court said that companies can spend whatever they want on politics, no restriction and or few restrictions. Um, and the result is our election cycle, say the 2024 election, will spend maybe $15 billion of campaign financing. Now, you don't get honest government with so much money changing hands. Uh, you get government that is purchased by the highest bidder. And this is uh, why the confidence in democracy has declined so much. You mentioned, of course, the power of big money. I, I wouldn't be so optimistic about the situation in Europe. I just believe because the economies are weaker, then uh, there's not so much money as in the US, but the tendency is practically uh, practically the same. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Joe Biden and, of course, then President Trump. Uh, 
um, probably will meet in, in elections next year. Probably. Um, do, do you see the crisis in, in leadership? Because when we uh, look in the past, we see many strong leaders who were both from Europe, from the United States, who were able to offer some vision and lead a society. Some of them even towards a peaceful society. We mentioned Willy Brandt, Olaf Palme. We can also mention. Well, we can also mention Ronald Reagan uh, as a special type of American heritage as well. Uh, I would say there is a certain decline in these leadership uh, qualities. Do, do you view it as well? Because in, in Europe, it's, I think, uh, very visible. <laughs> yes, I think the quality of uh, the political leadership in the US and Europe is very weak right now in general. Uh, speaking of the United States, uh, we have uh, two leading candidates, one of whom is 81 and can't find his way off the stage anymore. He happens to be our president. Uh, and uh, the other one is a convicted, uh, uh, is, is multiply convicted, uh, 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 psychologically unstable person uh, who now faces uh, dozens of criminal uh, counts right now in trials coming up. So Maybe we'll have a, a, a an octogenarian uh, who is uh, who should never be running and, and a convicted felon uh, running uh, uh, for the presidency. This is a terrible, terrible thing, obviously. Uh, how can we get there? There are some other candidates. Uh, I'm hoping that Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. Uh, proves himself as a highly capable candidate. And I like him. We were schoolmates. Uh, we're friends. Uh, and uh, he comes from a great political tradition. In fact, uh, his uncle, uh, John F. Kennedy, was, in my view, the last great American president. Uh, because uh, after that, well, we had some very nice and smart people. A few, not very many. Jimmy Carter was one. Uh, but um, we've had a lot of failed presidents uh, and oh. failed presidencies. So the quality of leadership is uh, is quite low. And in Europe, it's also really surprising to me how when the United States makes such bad judgments, European leaders tend to follow along uh, the U.S. lead. And of course, I'm very unhappy about the Ukraine war. I mean, everyone's unhappy about it, but I have a view that's somewhat different from the mainstream view, which is, in my interpretation, the war in Ukraine was caused by the U.S. wanting to expand NATO. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, many in Europe say, no, 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 it's all Putin. Uh, he, he did this. But I, I know enough history and I was present uh, at enough mm -hmm. events to know how much the U.S. provoked this war through absolutely stupid policies. Because if you're smart, you don't push a military alliance right up against Russia's border. Uh, that's just not a wise thing to do. Russia is extremely sensitive to... Uh, the military of the West encroaching on it because of how many times Russia has been invaded by the West. And especially when the United States politicians have so much hostility to Russia, which they do, they openly express the idea that Russia should be dismantled and many other things. Of course, Russia is going to see NATO expansion as a direct threat to national security, and it's not going to let it happen. So this uh, is just an example of terrible policy, predictable disaster. But the U.S. went along with it. Now, my point was the Europeans knew better. Mm -hmm. I know because many Europeans told me many times, oh, NATO expansion to Ukraine is very dangerous, but then mm -hmm. they don't say it in public. Uh, and uh, they don't say it in public because the United States uh, would get mad at them. And, uh, you know, they're afraid of the U.S. They shouldn't be afraid of the U.S. Europe should have its own independent foreign policy. 
and it should understand its own interests. Uh, and the interests are not just following along the United States. So this is a, a, just an, a very important example of the weakness of the political leadership right now in, in Europe as well as in the United States. Yeah, we, we see that here very well. So they're actually not able even to formulate the national interests. And I don't know if, if, if it's fear or simply they are not capable to understand what's going on. Maybe it's a combination of both. However, the, con uh, the consequences are really disastrous for the EU, both economically and politically, of course. What, you mentioned what, what, one, one European political leader said to me uh, a couple of years ago, oh, they don't take us seriously in Washington. And um, he said it even more colorfully, which I won't repeat exactly, but uh, this was a leader of a major country. And my thought was, yeah, but you should not allow yourself to be treated that way. That's your fault. Uh, that's not America's fault. Yes, America's arrogant, but stand up for Europe. Uh, and uh, this should be the approach, but it's not the approach. Well, it, it was a, 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 a happy occasion for me to be able to meet directly with the 15 members of the UN Security Council uh, and uh, lay out a proposition, which was a, a pretty basic one, which is that if the Security Council uses the powers that it has under the UN Charter, uh, Article 7, uh, and the powers to enforce UN Security Council resolutions, even the ones that have been adopted to date, it can end the raging wars around the world. I talked about four. I talked about, of course, the war in Ukraine. I talked, of course, about the war in Gaza. I talked about the war in Syria. And I talked about the war in Libya. And yes, at the core of all of these uh, has been U.S. meddling uh, in uh, Contra contradiction uh, in direct uh, violation of the UN Charter. At the core of the UN Charter is the doctrine of non-intervention. Leave others alone. A kind of golden rule between nations. And it's at the core of the UN Charter and it's the at the core of several uh, resolutions of the General Assembly. It's the overwhelming weight of global opinion, don't meddle in our internal affairs. Don't threaten other countries. Live alongside other countries. And I went through, of course, the uh, causes of these four conflicts, one after another. They're pretty straightforward. No one contradicted me in the chamber, not the, the American ambassador or anybody else. Of course, in Ukraine, the basic truth, which uh, you have been describing and uh, we have been discussing together from the start, is that this is a push by NATO for enlargement. And we had this remarkable interview by the Ukrainian senior politician laying it all out. It wasn't news, except that it came from a senior U uh, Ukrainian politician. So that was the first war. Stop the NATO enlargement. Stop the threats to other countries. The Israel-Gaza conflict could be stopped today, immediately, if the UN Security Council would enforce its many resolutions, probably in the dozens by now, calling for a two-state solution on 1967 borders. That is a state of Palestine with its capital in East Jerusalem, uh, and uh, its control over the Islamic holy sites. But that's not a notion to introduce now. That is a, a decision taken by the United Nations repeatedly and in the Security Council. The third war that I discussed is the ongoing war in Syria. Now, that has a simple origin, an incredible one, but a simple one. And that is that... Uh, Probably it was Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. Maybe it was the bright idea of uh, Barack Obama as president, but it got into the heads of uh, some American leaders. Hey, why don't we overthrow the government of Syria? 
Uh, and in late 2011, they decided, ah, Assad must go. And uh, President Obama signed a presidential finding uh, ordering the CIA to work with regional governments to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. Simple as that. Mind-boggling. Completely illegal. Did anyone refer the U.S. leaders to the International Criminal Court? No. It's, this is how this system misfires. And the, the arrogance of all of this, of course, is shocking because that was a dozen years ago. All it did was lead to mass bloodshed, destruction of places like Palmyra that had survived for 2,000 years, and then we have to destroy it because the CIA is given an order to overthrow a government. Well, if the UN Security Council enforced its non-intervention policies, that war too would stop. And the fourth war that I discussed was the war that has been raging in the Sahel since 2012. That's a war that started in Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad. It spread throughout this impoverished region. Why? Well, because uh, in 2011, again, against the UN Charter, against the decisions of the UN Security Council, the United States, UK, and France took it into their heads to overthrow Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. And under the ruse of protecting civilian populations with, uh, again, uh, false, exaggerated threats about the civilian populations, NATO bombed Libya throughout 2011 until Gaddafi was killed. Uh, a chaos uh, ensued in Libya and uh, armaments and uh, militias and others uh, spilled over into the impoverished region of the Sahel. Four out of four. My message was rather straightforward. Some would say naive, but I'm going to argue not naive. My message was stop the illegalities, enforce the UN Security Council resolutions, and end the wars. These are not primordial struggles that don't have an understanding or ancient battles that go forever. These are actually conflicts with identifiable causes, identifiable solutions, indeed solutions that have already been voted. But in general, the United States has pushed regime change or pushed its way to uh, enable Israel to absolutely ignore or block the UN Security Council for decades and Therefore, even when decisions are taken, they're not enforced. Now, people will say, well, that's fine and good, Professor Sachs. You're not telling us anything we don't know. First, I think it's often helpful to have what's called common knowledge in, uh, in, in my profession in economics, which means even if everyone knows it, it's important that everyone know that everyone else knows it so that everyone knows everyone's faking it a bit because you have to get it out on the table. Here's the straightforward understanding of these conflicts. Here's the straightforward understanding of how they can be ended. And it's up to you, the members of the UN Security Council. Now, the reason people will say it's naive is, well, that's the US. They have a veto. They can do whatever they want. But as you have been saying, and I have been repeating, the world is changing. This unipolarity claimed by the United States has been exposed for the fraud that it is. The U.S. is neither unipolar, nor is the rule-based system anything to do with rules. It's quite the contrary. And as the world comes to know this as common knowledge, we have the capacity actually to stop the abuses. Of course, the U.S. does it secretly, quote unquote. Uh, and because of the complicity of the mainstream media, you know, a lot of people don't know the facts. And when you tell them the facts, such as NATO caused the war in Ukraine, oh no, that's not true. Uh, but the facts 
do come out. Uh, David Arakamia, uh, the lead of Zelensky's party in the Ukrainian parliament, said it was all NATO, all the rest. And I'll quote him was blah, blah, blah. And by the way, if you didn't want to wait for David Arakamia to say it, uh, we heard it from Jens Stoltenberg, the secretary general of NATO in his little gaffe, meaning he told the truth by accident, uh, when he spoke to the European Parliament recently. So when the truth comes out, and then you have one country that really abuses the international system by breaking the rules of non-intervention on a daily basis, I believe that it's not naive to think that this behavior can be brought under control in the interests of peace. And just to finalize this uh, main point, another reason why it is not naive is that the Americans are sick of this. <laughs> the American people aren't saying, shut up, Jeff. Uh, you know, uh, let us do our thing. Every one of these is a complete debacle. Is, is the U.S. benefiting from Ukraine, from the hundred billion plus that it has put in from the disasters on the battlefield? Is that really helping the U.S.? No. Uh, the American people have said, stop this. Is the ongoing war in the Middle East really helping the United States? Uh, the U.S. standing back while Israel commits massive war crimes in Gaza, is that really strengthening the position of the United States? No. Uh, and the American people have turned on that, which is rather amazing given the uh, amount of, uh, uh, of, of sentiment on this over the years. There's a complete change of view, which has stopped this war. Uh, did the Americans benefit from this uh, completely absurd war in Syria, which was somebody's idea out of thin air. Why don't we overthrow that government? Did that really help the United States? Is the United States really helped by having instability across Western and Central Africa? Of course not. So even the American people who don't exactly hear much of the truth from the mainstream media have figured out this foreign policy doesn't work. And when Biden looks at his, I think, uh, rapidly uh, falling prospects of re-election, one of the things that's stark about American public opinion is they're, they're actually looking at foreign policy. Uh, and they're saying, we don't approve of what you're doing. So all of this is to say, for me, it was, uh, of course, an honor and, a, and an incredible opportunity to lay out in a, in a few minutes uh, what I think is not naive, uh, what I think is really the hope for the world. Let's live up to a charter that we have said, a charter of peace and non-intervention. It would do the world a lot of good. Absolutely. Can I just quickly go back to the Libyan affair? Because I remember that very, very well. The United States and Britain lobbied for two resolutions, two resolutions by the Security Council. And those resolutions are actually quite clear, and they were intended to facilitate negotiations for a settlement of the conflict that was taking place in the internal conflict in Libya. And the United States and Britain, in order to get those resolutions, made all sorts of assurances to the members of the Security Council, the other members of the Security Council, that they would be implementing those resolutions in good faith. And then, of course, what they did is they used the fact that the Security Council had passed those resolutions to carry out a bombing campaign in Libya, which was not in any conceivable way what the Security Council had authorised. And it disregarded the fact that the Security Council resolutions also said that the Security Council remained seized, in other words, responsible for the matter. They arrogated the authority of the Security Council to themselves. They usurped it. And that destroyed trust within the Security Council. So when okay. the Syrian crisis 
came along, it proved impossible for the Security Council to reach a consensus. This is an absolutely misuse of the mechanisms of the Council. And you mentioned that very well in your presentation. You touch on it very well in your presentation. And one cannot disregard the damage, it seems to me, that that episode has done and which continues to this day. Now, the other thing you mentioned is that these are absolutely resolvable problems. I agree. I think each and every one of these conflicts can be resolved very fast. Ukraine can be resolved. Even the Gaza situation, the Israel-Palestine situation can be resolved. But you also touched on something which you are perhaps better, you know, better position to discuss than anyone else, which is the economic aspect. And can you just enlarge on that a little? Because these, uh, we have to go back to the Charter, I agree completely, to the United Nations, to international law. But you talked about, for example, how the Middle East, Palestine, those territories will need a program for economic reconstruction. You could say the same about the Sahel, about all of these places. Can you touch on that and explain sure. that this is not actually going to be the impossibly costly thing that people imagine? Yeah, uh, just before I touch on the economics, just to come back to Libya for one moment, mm. the, the cynicism of it and and the uh, the fact that these wars are created by a small group <clears throat> of people is really something. The, the Libyan conflict came out of the imagination, <clears throat> I think probably of uh, Sarkozy, uh, who had personal issues with Gaddafi. Uh, it said, well, maybe Gaddafi funded a campaign, maybe... Uh, th there was a, a personal rift. It felt easiness because it was three governments, as you said, uh, UK, US, and France. That and and when I say governments, it was a small group within the governments. Reportedly, Hillary had to convince uh, Barack. Come on, Barack, we can do this. This is easy, you know, no problem. Uh, it's it's a walkover. Uh, I wondered because the Gaddafi in the in the year before that had. Uh, rather abused his time at the podium of the, the General Assembly uh, when he sp spoke, in, in, you know, in, in retrospect, it's a little sad, but he spoke for almost an hour and they were trying to usher him off the stage. I thought, okay, that's the retribution. We're going to overthrow you. Uh, you spoke too long. Whatever it is, this was a personalized thing. This was the same as overthrowing Assad. You know, Assad was viewed eh, even friendly to the U.S. Hillary had chatted him up, uh, talked him up uh, in U.S. circles a couple of years before. Then they decide, no, oh, we can take this guy out. And what's important to understand is how addicted the U.S. is to these regime changes. You know, uh, one excellent book, which I like to refer to, uh, is, is a book by uh, uh, an associate professor at Boston College, Lindsay O'Rourke, who just counted and studied carefully the secret regime change operations, the book is called Covert Regime Change, during the Cold War period by the United States, 64 attempts to overthrow foreign governments secretly, illegally. It's an addiction. And this is what destabilizes the world. And it's completely against the UN Charter. So in any event, this Libya thing was just uh, another of these uh, other debacles. But the point about the economics is uh, twofold, actually. One is that, of course, lurking among the incentives, the military industrial complex, the NATO enlargement, selling more weapon systems, the lobbying effort, which no doubt is a piece of this. You know, there's also typically games being played very often about who's going to control Libya's hydrocarbons uh, or uh, who's going to control uh, the offshore Mediterranean gas deposits, because actually Palestine has a claim to uh, these gas deposits, which are in Palestinian <clears throat> waters, if there were a state of Palestine. Uh, and the United States and Israel are just claiming this stuff. And so uh, and the Syrian uh, disaster, at least arguably, had to do with the, where pipelines would go. Uh, from the Caspian and the Black Sea through to the Mediterranean. So there are all sorts of games. Now, 
Whether they are the central motivators or not, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on the point of view. But there's usually some motive, and amazingly often it's oil and gas because that is is like the, the Midas curse uh, of, of our time, even until today. Then there's the second point, which is, my God, the Sahel is the poorest place on the planet. Not surprisingly, it's hyper-arid in much of the Sahel. It's landlocked in much of the Sahel. It lacks infrastructure. So you need an economic way out also. Israel has destroyed northern Gaza. It's unbelievable what's happened in recent weeks. Now, is there going to be a donor conference to pick up the pieces that Israel has just smashed to smithereens? Or is Israel going to pay for much of this? Well, time is going to tell. But in any event, there needs to be some economic development. Look what's happened to Syria the same way, not to mention Ukraine. Now, the basic point of economic development is actually straightforward and generally ignored or the opposite pursued by the United States. Economic development is be nice to your neighbors because you trade with them. You have uh, land routes with them. You have pipelines with them. You uh, share renewable energy resources. You share river sheds. You share biomes. If, As an economist, I would say the first rule of development is be nice to your neighbors. As an empire, the first rule is divide et impera, divide and conquer. And so the idea of the United States always is your next door neighbor's your enemy. Remember that. Your next door neighbor's your enemy. It's Orwell. And it has to be repeated over and over again because you say, ah, but my next door neighbor's my trading partner. No, your next door neighbor is your enemy. Uh, so if we get past imperial mentality and get to economic development mentality, your neighbor is your trading partner. Your neighbor shares river sheds. Your neighbor shares biomes. Your neighbor shares a power grid with you. Cooperate. So the point I was making was we need regional programs of cooperation. The idea that has gotten into the heads of the Ukrainian leaders, these particular leaders that we look west, we never look east. This is insane. You're going to develop that way? <laughs> Where is Ukraine? Ukraine is a bridge. It's a bridge between east and west. Are you kidding? That's a wonderful vocation for economic development. It, by the way, goes back to even the absurdities of 2013 before the U.S. engaged in the overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych in February 2014. Europe was saying to Ukraine, just us. You trade just with us. No trade agreements with Russia. Russia was saying, wait a minute. We are deeply integrated. If you just have one side trade agreement, that just diverts the economic flows. So let's have a three-way understanding, Russia, EU, Ukraine. That was viewed as a terrible terrible heresy. That's Putin recreating the Russian empire. This absurdity. Of course, Ukraine needs trade with Russia. Of course, Ukraine needs trade with Central Asia. Of course, Ukraine needs trade with Europe. It's a bridge. It's a great vocation to be a bridge, by the way. You get to charge for traffic in both directions. You get to trade in both directions. So this is true whether it's Israel and Palestine. This is true of the Sahel. This is true of Syria. All of it should be incorporated into a regional strategy. But the U.S. divide and conquer strategy has been the direct foe of this. And the whole U.S. strategy and geopolitics around the world is your neighbor is your enemy. We protect you. You allow us to put a military base there. We protect you against your worst enemy, which is your neighbor. And as long as that thinking goes on, it destroys economic logic. I think this is a topic we are going to return to much, actually, because the economics of reconstruction 
after wars. That's a subject that interests me a great deal, and I think are important to discuss. And, and, well. and just to say, you know, I mentioned at the end of my testimony that across the street on First Avenue, right across from uh, the, the UN uh, is what they call Isaiah's Wall. Of course, Isaiah was the uh, great Jewish prophet uh, of uh, the 8th century BCE, and he was the one who famously said, uh, they shall beat their swords uh, uh, into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And that's what's written on the wall. And the basic idea, which got paraphrased in the 20th century by Paul Samuelson and others, is guns versus butter. You know, in an economy, you can produce for military and destruction, or you can produce for human benefit. And so you have a trade off. And one of the ways to finance all of this development in the future is we're spending more than $2 trillion a year right now to destroy things. And yes, it's a business for a few uh, companies in the United States, Boeing and Northrop Grumman and uh, Lockheed and General Dynamics and so on. But for the rest of us, it is an absolute drain and destruction on economic well-being. And look at Europe, how it suffered in this war and continues to suffer. Of course, not nothing like Ukraine is devastation. But economics says not only be nice to your neighbor, but don't waste all your money on wars. Mm -hmm because you could use that for economic development. And that is Isaiah's idea. It, it, it goes back uh, about 2,700 uh, years or so. It's a very good idea. It, we're, we're coming to, towards the end of our time. I just wanted to briefly touch on one other point that you made, which is about peacekeeping forces. And you mentioned a possible peacekeeping force in the palace, not just in Gaza, but Across yeah, because the West Bank needs it too, because Israeli, exactly. Israeli settlers are rampaging in the West Bank. But, but could you enlarge on this? Because peacekeeping, I the, the idea of peacekeeping forces brought up, I think, firstly in the 1950s, it's actually been effective in some places, but it's also been uh, uh, less used recently. And, well, uh, I, th I think in the, uh, in the Gaza and uh, West Bank context, the UN Security Council could create a peacekeeping force drawn largely from the Arab neighboring countries, which want peace. And this is yet another of uh, the US and Israel myths. There's no one to talk to. There's no partner to talk to. Quite the contrary. In 2002, in the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, the uh, Arab League, and uh, that is uh, the Arab countries, said, we will normalize relations with Israel. We will help with security arrangements for Israel in the context of a two-state solution, spelled out so clearly. Of course, it's been the desire of Netanyahu and the United States to hide that obvious fact. But after the Gaza attacks after the Hamas attack, followed by the Gaza attacks, the Arab and Islamic leaders, including, as, as you've been reporting and discussing, uh, the president of, uh, of Iran, together said, we want peace. And they referred to the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative, which sits on the table. It could not be more explicit which is we will normalize relations with Israel. We will work for the security of Israel as well as Palestine. It's not rejectionist language. It's not destruction language. It's peace. And so these countries want it. They say it repeatedly. That's a point, obviously, I made uh, uh, in the Security Council as well. But it means that a peacekeeping force of Friendly Arab countries that normalize relations with Israel can also help to secure Gaza and the West Bank, protecting the people there and also demobilizing and demilitarizing the militias there as part of a peace agreement. So if we think constructively 
Uh, and if, by the way, not leave this conflict to Netanyahu and Hamas, you don't, because we know that hardliners on both sides have done everything, including killing the leadership when they felt they needed to to block agreements, uh, whether it was uh, 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 Anwar Sadat assassinated uh, by Egyptian uh, hardliners or whether it was Yitzhak Rabin assassinated by uh, an Israeli right-winger. They have gone to the extent of killing the leaders to block moderation. But the point of the UN and the point of the UN Security Council is that in the interests of the two peoples and the interest of world peace and security, the solution can be put into effect directly. I'm not waiting for Netanyahu on this one. We just need the UN Security Council to enforce its agreements and peacekeepers can be an important part of that. Peacekeepers drawn in significant part from the cooperating uh, Arab countries in the region. You mentioned uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, of course, now it's not so much in spotlight as more of the news concentrates on what is going on uh, between Israel, Hamas and the situation in the, in the Gaza Strip. So suddenly we see that Ukraine is not n number one, at least not in the uh, foreign policy topics. Um, do you see any possible way out of the conflict? I mean, a peaceful way out, or at least a satisfactory way out of this conflict. As you mentioned, um, this is really a proxy war. Of course, the, the Ukraine is a pawn simply in, in, in the game. And in effect, it's a war of Russia against NATO, especially against the United States. So uh, is there a possible change, for example, coming with the next election in the United States? Or is it just wishful thinking? Well, the thing we should understand, if if you're playing poker and you have a lousy hand and uh, each time it comes to you, you raise the ante. And uh, when the opponent uh, matches you, meets, your, uh, meets you, you up the ante, even though your hand is lousy. Maybe you're bluffing or maybe you don't know how to play poker. But that is what the West has done with Russia. Because the West said, we're going to expand NATO to Ukraine. And at first, Russia didn't say, uh, oh, we're going to conquer the territory. Russia just said, don't do that. We respect Ukraine's borders. And all we want is a long-term lease for our naval fleet in Sevastopol. And that was what Viktor Yanukovych, the president of Ukraine, delivered between 2010 and 2013, a long-term lease for Russia and neutrality. Okay, we don't want to join NATO. It's, you know, we're in between. Then the United States and Europe really helped to overthrow Yanukovych. We should be clear about this. In February 2014, the United States played a direct role in the overthrow of Yanukovych. And they brought in an anti-Russian government. And at that point, President Putin said, okay, we're not going to let Crimea fall into NATO hands. So we'll organize a referendum. And uh, the people of Crimea, no doubt, overwhelmingly were Russian and wanted to be part of Russia uh, and uh, voted to become part of Russia. The West said, no, oh, this is completely unacceptable. Then uh, the Russian regions of eastern Ukraine, the Donbass, of course, said, uh, we don't like this new government. It's very radical. It's very anti-Russian. It's trying to cancel Russian culture and Russian language. We want autonomy and the two breakaway republics of Lugansk and Donetsk uh, took place. And the Ukrainian government attacked them uh, as renegade provinces, but it militarily attacked them. And then came the Minsk agreements, Minsk I and Minsk II, to stop the fighting. And Minsk II, in particular, was endorsed by 
the UN Security Council. And Russia didn't say, we're going to take the Donbass. Russia just said, honor the Minsk II agreement, which gives autonomy to these regions and respect for the Russian language and Russian culture. Pretty reasonable, actually. But the Ukrainians and the Americans said, no way. We're not going to honor an agreement, even though the UN Security Council adopted it. And so Minsk II was never in, uh, implemented. And interestingly, uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany was supposed to be a guarantor of Minsk II. And then she admitted in a, in a press conference uh, a year ago, oh, we didn't really mean it. It just gave time for Ukraine to strengthen its defenses and so forth. Well, this is very cynical and very destructive. But the reason I mention it is Russia was not calling for Ukrainian territory. Except we raised the stakes in this poker game. Mm. And then Russia said, OK, we'll take Crimea. And the United States said, and we want autonomy for the Russian regions. No, no, no. We raised the stakes. No autonomy. And then Russia's, okay, Russia said at the end of 1991, look, this situation is not controlled. Minsk is not being enforced. NATO is still intending to enlarge to Ukraine. This is the last chance we demand negotiations with the United States. And President Putin put on the table a draft agreement with the U.S. on December 17, 2021. And the United States said, no, we're not negotiating any of that with you. That's arrogance. They did it again. I called the White House at the end of 2021 and spoke with senior official and said, negotiate with Russia. Avoid the war. Oh, don't worry, Professor Sachs. Uh, and uh, of course, the United States rejected negotiations and the special military operation started. Now, this is also very interesting. At the time of the special military operation, the two regions, Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, claimed independence. Russia did not annex them until September 2022. Just, they claimed independence. Of course, the United States said no, but immediately Zelensky said, okay, okay, we can negotiate with Russia. And in March 2022, there were negotiations. And they were actually going to reach an outcome of Ukrainian neutrality and an end to the war. And then what happened? The United States stepped in and said, no, don't do that. We don't accept that. Well, how stupid is that? You have a losing hand, but they raise the ante one more time. Now, why did they do that? because they're basically ignorant. They, in this case, they didn't understand how bad their hand was. They looked at their cards and they said, we're going to impose economic sanctions and this will bring Russia to its knees and we will ship HIMAR missiles and this will destruct, uh, destroy the uh, Russian military. This is a fantasy world of these people these neocons in Washington. So they raised the stakes one more time. Uh, they said no to a negotiated peace. They said no to Ukrainian neutrality. And the war continued. And now where are we uh, in uh, this advanced stage of the war? Russia is absolutely destroying one Ukrainian army after another. This is obvious. And the much talked about uh, Ukrainian hyper uh, uh, counter offensive that was uh, supposed to take place in June 2023 and reach the Sea of Azov. <laughs> of course, it didn't reach anything. It didn't do anything other than kill tens of thousands of Ukrainians and cost an unbelievable amount of uh, money in destroyed tanks, weapon systems, uh, artillery, uh, everything. So it's been a disaster. These 
are the worst poker players I've ever seen. All they do with a lousy hand is keep raising the stakes and keep losing. Maybe now they are trying to to shift focus, shift attention to, to Gaza or maybe to some other conflicts. Because actually when you are losing in one, then ah, you can try but, you to know, induce you, more chaos. You asked me a question which I didn't answer. <laughs> I gave a long answer. If there but, is a way but, out. No, no, but you asked me a question, what to do? And and the point I would make is the first thing we should do is stop raising the ante, you know? Stop saying, oh, we're going to defeat them. It's easy. Uh, we're going we're gonna to beat them. No, Ukraine's not going to defeat Russia. And the more that this goes on, the more dead Ukrainians there are. That's just the most basic point. And the whole society has been so profoundly wounded because millions and millions of Ukrainians are in Europe or are in Russia and hundreds of thousands are dead because of this. So the population has collapsed and there aren't young people anymore. Now they want to draft kids and young women because they've run out of soldiers. It's terrible. And so we need to stop raising the ante. Now, what would that mean? We need to negotiate. We need to say first, okay, NATO is not enlarging. But Russia, you have to stop taking more and more Ukraine. And what the Russians are going to say at this point is, okay, we keep the following territories. And we're going to have to negotiate over that because the idea that, no, we don't make any concessions, you're just going to be defeated, is going to end up destroying all of Ukraine. It's, it's raising the stakes on a lousy hand. And we should recognize that we are going to need a political outcome right now, not the one we wanted, but we were so dumb not to take a better deal a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that now we're in a situation where we're not going to get exactly what we, quote, want. But to continue the fighting would absolutely destroy even more. Mm -hmm. What worries me most is actually that really the, the lives of Ukrainians are just taken as a, as a casualty, as something not even worth speaking about. They don't as. even talk about it. The no. leadership no. is absolutely gross. You know, I look, I, I'm sure that uh, Zelensky is in a very hard place, but all he talks about right now is throwing more lives to the graves. Frankly, no strategy. No self-awareness, no situational awareness. Okay, it's very sad because the United States talked him out of a peace agreement in March 2022. That was Zelensky's chance, and he lost it. He was inexperienced. You know, when you the United States comes and tells you, we have your back. You, you know, you tend to believe it if you're inexperienced. I tried to tell him, by the way, I, you know, I, I really tried to tell the Ukrainians, look, I'm, a, I'm an old guy. I've been through lots of U.S. wars, Vietnam War, Nicaragua, uh, the Gulf Wars, uh, Syria. They never win. Are you kidding? Do you really want to end up like Afghanistan? And oh. they didn't believe me. They just thought, oh, you're a Putin apologist. Uh, so they didn't want to hear any of this. But I was telling them the hard facts about American wars, and they didn't want to hear it. Uh, besides Russia, uh, I'm not sure that Ukraine actually is such a big topic uh, in uh, in American uh, policy. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's maybe, maybe definitely the minute, You know, it's a big focus of the political class still, the military industrial complex and the White House. Maybe for just political reasons that uh, Biden doesn't want to admit what a lousy poker player he is. But the, the point is, uh, for the American people, they've had enough. There's no groundswell of support. People don't want that. They want to stop this thing. And so in that sense, you're absolutely right. Typically, the public doesn't have much say in this. We have almost no public debate. But Biden's popularity is really collapsing. And if the 
uh, unhappiness with Biden's foreign policy is very, very clear. So maybe even public opinion is going to start playing a role because we're now in an election year. Um, I would uh, like to ask you to clear the position on China, because when I look both at the Republicans or at the Democrats, I would say that their views on China are very similar. So they actually have very hostile views uh, towards China. Uh, now there was a summit, uh, APEC, where uh, both presidents, Biden and Xi Jinping, met. Um, do you see any, any decline in tension, any hopes that actually the relations, they are probably not going to be friendly, but let's say at least stabilize and, and would be less, less threatening for the world? I'll tell you an interesting thing. When uh, President Xi came to this APEC summit in San Francisco, he met uh, 200 U.S. business leaders and they gave him a standing ovation. I don't think they would give an American president a standing ovation, but they gave President Xi a standing ovation. Why? China is their biggest market. They both produce in China, they sell in China, they make a lot of money in China, and they want normal relations. What, what is happening is two things. One, we have a kind of security class in America who uh, are all about uh, American dominance, American hegemony, America being number one. It's a very strange group of people, uh, but this is uh, our foreign policy establishment. Then we have politicians who basically uh, think that, and it's very particular, uh, Trump in 2016 won the election by winning swing states in the middle of America, in the American Midwest, which is our industrial zone. And he won it by saying, China took your jobs away. Mm -hmm. And when he made narrow victories in those states, the Democrats said, oh, we have to attack China in order to compete politically with Trump. So there are two reasons for the anti-China sentiment in the United States. One and in the political class, one is this idea of America being the only dominant country. Well, I mean, you know, you know, unless you're playing a board game like the game of risk, you don't get to be the dominant country in the world when there are other big countries around. So this is arrogance again, very misguided. Then there is this protectionist politics. Uh, which uh, tries to appeal to a few swing states in the U.S. elections. The upshot of this is that the political class, both Democrats and Republicans, are pretty united against China, pretty ignorant from my experience. They don't know China. Oh. They don't know Chinese history. They don't have any perspective. They play a dangerous game like when uh, our Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi flew to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So stupid. Sorry. Just why do you want to provoke another thank superpower? You, thank you for saying that. Because no, we so have the same stupid. representatives who are also provoking China right. in this in this country. No. Okay, don't provoke China. Be respectful. Just have normal relations. Don't provoke a superpower. Why? What is in it to poke a superpower? It's stupid. People should think, you know, if there's some, even if you think there's a bully, which China's not, but if you think there's a bully in the schoolyard and you're a, you know, a little kid and you think they're the bully, is it really smart to go poking them and say, you're a bully, I hate you? No, you're going to get hurt in the end. So you need some common sense. And China's not even bullying. China is just big, successful, dynamic, actually a good trade partner for Europe. So we should treat it normally, respectfully. And uh, the U.S. anxieties should not be Europe's anxieties. This is another area where European politicians mm -hmm. are just repeating the words of American politicians. And you know 
I know behind the scenes, it's although it's obvious, you know, why does Vanderleyen repeat words almost like Biden? Because she feels that her job is to be with the United States. Maybe she hopes the United States appoints her as the Secretary General of NATO or something. I don't know oh, what goodness. it is. No, but that's what, what she hopes maybe. So oh. this is where Europe makes a big mistake, just like it did make a big mistake in Ukraine. It would make a big mistake of trying to make an enemy out of China. That's a completely ridiculous losing proposition. Oh. Uh, my last question, because time, our time is coming up, I have to reflect one very current event you already mentioned, and that's uh, the elections in Argentina. Yes. Because let's say that uh, the elected president is an um, unusual personality. Um, how, how do you view this situation? Um, is there a danger for, for BRICS or, or maybe for other Latin American countries with his very strange suggestions as for foreign policy, as for economics. Yeah, of course, time will tell. One thing is uh, he won the presidency, but has uh, no uh, control over the Congress. Uh, his small parties, and at least for the moment, doesn't have any kind of governing coalition in the Congress. So maybe his... Uh, ability to uh, do things will require a much broader coalition of forces, and that could be a, a constraint. But let me just say first, Argentina is a country that has been unstable for its whole history, going back to the 1820s, ever since independence. Argentina has messed up more currencies, had more inflation, and more instability than any other place on the entire planet. This guy won, not because of what he says, but because of disgust with the outgoing government, which was delivering inflation of triple digits, uh, more than 100%. You can't really win an election when inflation is a uh, triple digit. And I know Argentina quite well uh, and actually worked with the finance minister just before this one. And he ended up, he was doing a good job and he ended up being not forced out. He resigned, unfortunately, uh, but he resigned because his own, I would say, corrupt politicians in his own party were uh, rejecting the normal policies that he was trying to promote. So Argentina is now in yet another cycle of instability. Uh, all my professional career as an economist, I've been watching Argentina in amazement because it's it's not an impoverished country by any means. And it's you know got huge natural wealth and, uh, mm. and very smart people, um, well-educated uh, class of people. But it has made such a political mess repeatedly. And this could be yet another one. I don't want to say on the first day after the election of uh, this guy that he'll really govern the way he campaigned because sometimes they become a lot more responsible. But it could be that, he's, <laughs> that he is what he says he is, in which case uh, Argentina is going to face some real troubles. I don't. I, it, it's regrettable because I'm I'm a a fan of the BRICS. I would like to see them work. Argentina is a new member of the BRICS group. Uh, whether this guy stays in or out of the BRICS or gets kicked out of the BRICS, everything remains to be seen. Uh, but I uh, I only hope that this guy was making this as a persona, not as a real politics, because uh, his real politics, uh, if delivered this way, would be very, very detrimental to Argentina.